During the world's brief history of writing technology, it's easy to believe that most of the world's knowledge has been obtained through stories. Stories have served as documentation, education, and even persuasion. Today, you can't go to a marketing event without someone teaching the art of storytelling. Why? Well, because humans love stories, and we just don't all know how to communicate through stories. And even more so, we don't realize how, as business people, stories can be used to effectively communicate and, more, and, and move people to action. My guest this episode is a global thought leader on authentic leadership and business storytelling. She has worked with some pretty amazing organizations such as the Obama Foundation, Ernst & Young, Visa, Amazon, National Australia Bank, and Uber, just to name a few. She is also an author of seven books, and her latest, Magnetic Stories, debuted at number two on Australia's business book list. I look forward to talking about that today, too. To share insights on storytelling for business, I'm happy to welcome to the podcast, Gabrielle Dolan. Hey, Gabrielle. Hi, Lee. It's really good to be here. Good to have you here. You all the way from Australia. I am all the way from Australia. Well, virtually all the way from Australia. Virtually, yeah. I'm, I'm, thank you for joining me because I know we, you know when we have um, we have guests this far apart, the uh, time zones are always a challenge to to make it convenient for everybody to uh, not be too early and not too late. Yes, we got to strike that balance of not not too early for me, not too late for you. Definitely, definitely. Well, talking about storytelling, Gabrielle, um, I have to admit, as a marketer. I've heard many people attempt to drive home the idea of storytelling, but the reality is that there is no doubt that business people need to understand how to tell stories more effectively. So why is it so important for a business person to understand storytelling? Yeah, I guess, I mean, I guess to answer that, I'll share how I got into it. I, I used to work in um, corporate. I used to work in one of Australia's largest banks and spent, you know, probably the first 20 years of my life in corporate and progressively, you know, climbed the ranks and we got into senior leadership roles. And my last couple of roles, they were not only in senior leadership, so managing people, they were also in change management roles, so pushing out major changes across the organisation. And what I started to notice is that when I shared a story to do that, people seem to understand the message better, but not only understand it, but actually remember it and then do something as a result of it. And then I started to notice that the really good leaders were also doing that. The really good presenters were doing that. The good salespeople, um, marketers were doing that. So I left my corporate job 17 years ago because I, um, because of my experience, um, you know, my work in leadership development and design, I really believe that I could teach business people how to share stories more effectively because, you know, as you said in the intro, we're humans. We we love stories. You, that, that's why you see a lot of it. We're sort of hardwired to share stories and listen to stories. But I could see business people didn't know how to do it or didn't know why to do it or didn't think they had any stories to share. So that's why I think it's important for business people to learn how to do it and learn how to do it well. Interesting. So you mentioned our, our core audience on this this podcast, which I, which I think is a lot of marketers and, and salespeople. So I want to get your take on storytelling by bringing some insights from both for both sales professionals and for marketing professionals separately. So first, let's start with for a sales professional. Can you give an example of how a salesperson can use storytelling in, in their job? Yeah, well, when when you look at um, salespeople, for example, what, what they're really trying to do is build trust and respect and strengthen that relationship. So there's an opportunity for them to use a story first up in the relationship to fast track that trust and respect and to, and to, I guess, to sell their product and service or throughout the relationship to strengthen the relationship. I, I remember coming across um, one amazing story. Um, so, Lee, just, just just say, for example, I know, I know you have children, but say, for example, you're looking for a childcare centre to leave your child. You run into this woman and um, she used to be a dentist and she tells you that um, I used to be a dentist and um, me and my husband took a while to fall pregnant and when we eventually did fall pregnant and I w wanted to go back to work, Work, I was looking for a childcare centre, but I couldn't find any childcare centres that my son would love. So I decided to buy one and turn it into a centre that my son would love. And so when you're hearing this story, I bet you you're thinking, I'm going to send my child here. <laughs> it's like, so it's like yeah. that backstory that shows her values, um, that's really good in sales. That is a world of difference from, by the way, I have a childcare centre. 
Here's yeah. my business card. Yeah, exactly. So often in sales, what we tend to do is we talk about the products and the benefits and, um, you know, the service and the benefits and why you should buy from me. But through that one story, because I know that where their values come from, I'm, I'm buying them already. I'm literally saying, sign me up. I like that you said values because it, it goes beyond the company and into the individual. So now I have an understanding of not just the business, but I've also developed a picture in my head of what it would be like for my child to be there through her story and giving her full experience of, of who she is and what she'd want for her children. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is an example, I guess, of a, of a founder's story. But so if, you know, if you're not the founder, you could still share that story. But as a salesperson, it is absolutely sharing stories about um, your own personal values that you could use them. And that really strengthens the relationship with your clients and customers. Okay, so let's switch tables a bit to the marketer beyond the cliches and because we know they're telling a brand story, but what can an individual marketer do to utilize storytelling in their job? Um, yeah, great question. So individually, um, as a marketer, especially um, in their job, so when you think of what marketers do, they're trying to heavily influence, they might be speaking to the executive leadership team um, or the other business units to influence them to do something so they can use stories to do that. In their role as a marketer, um, and some of the things I cover in the book, it's all the different types of stories they can share. So I think when it comes to brand storytelling, a lot of marketers focus on that, you know, the origin story, why the company started that creation story. But it's looking at all the different types of stories around the customers, around employees, around challenges, around, you know, culture. And again, I say culture going back to sharing the values of the company. So... You mentioned the origin story and, you know, when a person hears brand storytelling, that's one of the first things I think they think about is a company's or a brand's origin story um, of the brand. But I'm guessing that it's a lot more than that. So can you give us a few practical bullet points to consider when seeking to begin brand storytelling? Yeah, the first so the first thing where you need to start, Lee, is to know, well, what do you want your brand to be? So, um, and when I, again, when I look at brand, I think from a lot of people in marketing would look at a brand and think it's your, it's your logo, um, it's your tagline, it's your colours and all that, which which is is part of the brand. But to me, your brand is your values. The, the best um, definition I love of brand, you can, you know, you Google brand, you get lots of different definitions. So the one I love the most comes from Jeff Bezos and he says that your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. My tweak on that is that your brand are the stories people share about you when you're not in the room. So if it's around the stories, because again, we're human, so we naturally share and share stories, it's taking control of those stories. And so this is the, my concept of brand storytelling. So being really clear on what you want your brand to be. So do you want people to be sharing stories about how innovative you are, how, um, you know, you always do the right thing by customers, how collaborative you are? So it's being clear on what you want to be known for. Is it innovation? Is it quality? Is it, um, you know, uh, respect? So being clear on those. Then it is, I think there is definitely a process of educating people in the power of stories, so how they can share these stories more effectively and what they can do to create stories. But then it becomes this real cyclical process of, of finding the stories, actually finding these stories, communicating them, and then creating them. And what I mean by creating them is doing things, so living your brand, actually living your values that generate stories. So if you want to be known for exceptional customer service, you have to do, you have to be good at exceptional customer service, mm -hmm. which then generate stories. But then now that you've got that story, how could you perhaps share it more widely? How could you share it in your induction? How could you put it on social media? So it's, it's finding ways to then share those stories more broadly. Well, let's turn this storytelling internally because you mentioned this earlier about how you can use stories or how you've used stories internally to to share and, and, and maybe guide in a leadership role. So 
what can a leader do? How can a leader use storytelling to be more effective? Yeah, so it's a, it's a similar thing. As a company, you go, well, what are my values? What are we? What am I be known for? Um, leaders should do the same thing. They should be clear on what their values are. A lot of the time, leaders are targeted or charged with communicating the company values. So, so let me let me give you an example. I think will highlight yeah. what how I think you could use stories internally. I I run workshops predominantly. I just go into organisations and run workshops teaching leaders how to share stories more effectively and to communicate the company values. And um, this came from one example. One of the company values was integrity. So, you know, again, a lot of companies have that value, integrity. It's, it's normally just written on a wall. It's not necessarily done. <laughs> in practice. Yeah, it's not in practice. There's a very big difference between um, in practice and uh, words on a wall. I worked with this woman, um, one of the name, her Anne. So this, the process I go through, you go, okay, so you want to communicate integrity. The first thing you got to do is, well, what does that mean to you? So drilling down what it means to you. And so saying things, well, it means um, if you say you're going to do something, do it. If, if always tell the truth, um, doing the right thing all the time. So it's been really clear. And then, then I sort of go down, okay, so one of the things she landed on was doing the right thing all the time. So then I take people through the process and I think for leaders it's really important to share personal stories. So when I say personal stories, it just means stories that don't happen at work, okay? So just it doesn't have to be your biggest aha moments of your life, but it's just something that happened to you outside of work. So this is the story she started to share to communicate to her team that value of integrity. Um, and and I'll, I'll pretend I'm her, Lee, and, you, and I'll talk to you about what, what okay. you get from this story. So um, Anne said, when I was a, uh, you know, in the 60s, my dad was a professional swimmer. And he reached the point in his career where he actually tried out for the National Swim Squad. And on the day of the meet, he was winning his race and he got to the end to do the tumble turn and he slightly misjudged the wall. So he completely missed the wall. Now, this was in the 60s, so it was way before sensors and they had judges up there, but with all the splashing and kicking, they knew he wouldn't hit the wall or not. And so, But he had to make a split-second decision. Does he go back and touch the wall or does he just keep swimming? And he decided to go back and touch the wall. Now, you don't really recover from a race when you do that, and he didn't, and he never, ever made the national swim squad. And I would sometimes ask Dad, is there any days you regret going back to touch the wall? And he would always say, I've never regretted that because if I didn't go back and touch the wall, I'd have to spend the rest of my life knowing I did the wrong thing. And I'm sharing this with you because when I think of our value integrity, I think of my dad. It's only a matter of time before we will come across our own go back and touch the wall moment. And I invite you to consider what my dad would do. So, mm. Lee, have, what does that story tell you about her? Like, what what do you get from that story? Well, you know, I was listening to the structure of that story because I could tell it was very intentional. And I like how you ended it with, you know, what I'm getting from this story, what, I'm, what I want to share with you from this story, mm. as opposed to the moral of the story is. I mean, you actually kind of, you, you said that, but you, you led me on a journey uh, with, with emotion and had me leaning forward to hear what's next in a way that giving instruction wouldn't have done, um, especially if it's boilerplate talking about integrity. If it was, this is what integrity is, this is the definition of integrity, this is, this is why our company has integrity, it gave an example of integrity and made you want to live up to the story that you just told. Yeah, it's, it's a, very powerful. Yeah, and I love the fact that you, you noticed the structure and I didn't end on the moral of the story is. it's That is almost one of the worst ways to end a story. So the moral of the story is you need to do the right thing all the time. It, was, it would be like, don't tell me what to do, but it's, yeah, it's like gotcha. Yeah, yeah. What you should, yeah, yeah. But through through the story and through the ending that way, you know, she literally said, "I invite you to consider what my dad would do." Um, it's 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 helping people. They're still getting the message. They're still getting mm -hmm. the moral of the story, so to speak. But they're they're getting it, and you're not forcing it on them. They're they actually taking it. So, um, 
it, it's it's a really powerful story, really powerful story. And it's it's um, you know through the story, she's almost she's sort of saying this is the expectation I hold myself to. The subtle message is that she clearly expects them to behave that way. She's creating this culture of it's not win at all cost. It's um, you know doing the right thing. Um, and of course, then she's got to be true to that. She's got to be congruent. She her actions have to you know live up to that story. Hmm. Well, I know. Gabrielle, that you you're you're a speaker, you do a lot of speaking, and you know, it can't be much of a, a greater tool to have to be a storyteller while you're out speaking because you you're actually speaking on one of the best skills that a that a speaker could have, which is storytelling. Um, I'm right now working on a keynote myself, and the the keynote wasn't planned as an A B C what I want to teach you. It was a personal story that happened first. And from that story, I realized that there's a lesson to be learned in this story. So the story came first. And then I said, okay, well, this is a great story with some lessons in it that I can tie into this particular business purpose. And so I'm using it as a, I guess you could say as a, as a conduit or as a way to, tra- to transpire this lesson on top of an existing story. So what's your advice when someone is, you know, they, they know they have a point to make and they know they should tell a story. How can they pull that business purpose together with a story without it being contrived? Like you obviously made the story up to fit this business case. I mean, how do you, do you seek, like, like I did, for example, I had the, the story came first and then I applied it to, this is a good business lesson in here somewhere, which, which is the best approach for someone who actually wants to actively begin story, telling stories. Yeah. Um, so first of all, Lee, well done on starting your presentation with the story. I think regardless of whether the message comes first and you've got to try to find a story or the story comes first and you go, that would be a great um, story to get that message across, starting your presentation with a personal story is such an engaging way to start your presentation. It's got to be a message. It, it, this isn't start, you know, telling a funny story just as a bit of an icebreaker. That's terrible. But if it's setting up the context of the presentation, if it's setting up why this is important to you, it sort of almost builds um, credibility and emotional connection right from the start. And it's it's such a brilliant way to start presentations. And that's one of my, you know, I do presentation training as well. And I always say, start with a personal story. But in answer to your question, what comes first, the, you know, the chicken or the egg, the story or the message, it's sometimes both. So normally in business, when we're starting out in business, you would sort of say, well, what are the messages I want to communicate? So the message does come first. And then I work with people go, well, how can you find a story? What's a a story you could share? And it could be a personal story and it could be a work-related story as well. But um, don't dismiss the personal stories because I think they're the most powerful. Or sometimes it could be I'm looking for a message on this and then things happen to you. If you've got your storytelling radar up, things will happen to you and you sort of go, where could I use that story? So I'm, you know, a lot of my keynotes are around communication and effective communication and how miscommunication can happen all the time. So um, I actively look for stories, but then when things happen, I go, oh, that's a great story. I could use. So um, I'll, I'll give you another little quick example, Lee. I sometimes start my presentations with this. And, and when I say I start my presentations, literally walk up and it's the first thing out of my mouth. Before I even say, hello, good to be here, it's the first thing out of my mouth. I um, The story I often share is I talk about my two daughters. My two daughters, Alex and Jess, I was driving them to school one day and Jess was about 12 at the time and I heard her telling Alex hey Alex do you know when lovers communicate they go I'm thinking what What is she saying and I'm thinking surely I misheard that and I said what did you just say Jess and she goes I was just telling Alex how lovers communicate I'm I'm a bit shocked and then I go where did you hear that where did you see that and she went I saw it on the internet and so then I start going like you know, I'm driving and trying not to run off the road and it's going, I don't know what you're doing, watching lovers on the internet and, you know, going. And she looked at me and she goes, Mum, I never said lovers. I said llamas. <laughs> like, so, so I literally sort of say if miscommunication can happen so easily from the back seat of the car to the front seat of the car, no wonder it can happen across an organisation where a lot of the time we're saying llama 
and they're hearing lover and it's freaking them out. So I literally use that really funny story that happened just to set up the context that but miscommunication happens. And so, and then I go into, you know, how do you avoid that or reduce that? Definitely. We, you know, I look forward to to reading your book and maybe catching your one of your presentations somewhere because not only do I know that I'll learn about storytelling, I'll actually get some great stories in the process <laughs> of listening to you. Yeah. So before we go, tell me about your, about your book and uh, how we can find you. Um, so the, the latest book, Lee, is called Magnetic Stories, as you said, connect with customers and engage employees with brand storytelling. And the tagline pretty much is what it's about. The reason I wrote it, I, you know, you sort of, I've written a fair few books on storytelling and the last one I wrote is, I don't, I don't think I can, I don't think I've got any more else, thing else to say. But um, what I did start as, to notice is that this whole concept of brand storytelling and storytelling was really getting traction. I mean, you know, when I started this 17 years ago, it wasn't overly used, but now everyone was starting to talk about storytelling and our brand story. And what I noticed is a lot of companies were trying to do it, but not doing it very well, thinking thinking, you know, that their brand story was just that origin story or thinking brand storytelling is about one story. So I saw this mm-hmm. this going on and I saw a lot of people who had brilliant stories to share but weren't sharing them um, because they didn't know how, they didn't think they were important. So then I just thought, I, you know, I need to write a book about this. So it, it really, I had a whole lot of fun writing this book because it's not only about how you implement brand storytelling and the five different types of stories you should be um, sharing, but I spoke to so many companies from around the world that has got such amazing stories. So I've had people, like my mum read the book and she goes, I loved reading that book. Now she's got, you know, she's 87 years old. She's not doing anything about brand storytelling, but just reading the stories of, you know, all these companies from around the world from, it's just some amazing story. So I hope what the book does, it gives you, I hope that gives the reader clarity around what brand storytelling is and what it isn't. I hope it gives them the knowledge to do it well, but most importantly, I hope it gives them the inspiration from hearing all the amazing stories that other companies are sharing. That is great. So where can, uh, what's your website and how can we, uh, connect with you? Yeah, I'm on all the, you know, normal socials, LinkedIn and, and stuff, but probably the best um, is gabrieldolan.com. Um, you can get on there, you can access my books and free chapters for the book, uh, but you can also get onto, I've got a seven day storytelling starter kit. Um, it's free and it's, it is what it says. It's uh, seven days. You'll get something from me to just get you started on storytelling. So you can access that from the website as well. That's wonderful. Well, Gabrielle, thank you for joining me. And uh, and thanks to the listeners. If you're listening to the podcast and you want to see Gabrielle and I video the podcast and others are available in the podcast section of contentmaster.com. Again, Gabrielle, thank you for joining the podcast. Thanks, Leigh. I've loved it. Thank you for listening to the Business of Marketing podcast, a show brought to you by contentmonster.com, the producer of B2B digital marketing content. Show notes can be found on contentmonster.com as well as aleejudge.com. To continue the conversation, be sure to follow the podcast on your favorite podcast platform.